Okay, so all this nice job assignments. People figure out you've got 90 degree assignments and that means that in the class is much shorter, smaller today. Um, I sent you guys mail with the name of the directory in which uh, you can deposit things. So please don't send me mail. It's pain to download attachments. Uh, and uh, uh, one student actually sent me a YouTube video. And I wonder if he's not here right now. Um, no, I don't know whether he took the, the camera or it could be the screen recorder because I'm trying to figure out if there's a free screen recording recorder available because that's a very good one. I don't know what it's called. I can tell you. Sorry? I don't know what it's called. I've used it for IPFP. Okay. Um, I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I was uh, doing the demo for you guys in class, you know how I'm recording my lectures here and I wanted to record that whole session too. And I used something that WebEx provides, and uh, WebEx has, the, which is a tool that you know I have installed on my computer, and it doesn't create uh, a standard format, so I couldn't figure out how to convert it. Okay. Um, any questions? Just, just give it to me at the end of the class. You know, it's much easier for me to look at screenshots rather than go to a directory, open a file. If you want a video, I mean, you can't, you know, quite give me a paper printout. But uh, so for now, I just want to make sure that you guys are on track. At some point, we'll, you know, I'll have the final version submitted where I'll actually do a demo with you guys. Um, you know, when I was planning out the semester, like I said, I, like I told you, I did all the planning during the summer, and normally I have to do the planning during the semester to see things are going and you just you just uh, don't realize certain things like uh, we started a class on a Wednesday rather than a, we had only one class the first week and then we had Labor Day so uh, you know we've had two fewer lectures till now than we would have had if you were Tuesday Thursday and uh, so that's why in terms of what I'm, I'm covering what I need to cover in class uh, so we're a little behind in lectures and uh, uh, so you might have more milestones in your first project. We'll just make it bigger and bigger. So there's a lot on the menu there. And so um, what I suggested in the document was that you do uh, um, at least two, two, two processes thinking for this assignment. And I also suggested have, have N processes thinking through some cell. Okay? And then I gave you some milestones for the, for the other week. And I'll just increase those milestones. Well, there was like eight things you could have done. And you can do your own things too. That's just a suggestion. Um, but uh, we'll just add to that because I also have to go to a conference uh, in the last week of this month. So that will further take two lectures. Okay, so we're going to do threads. And threads are normally um, things you would, you know, you say, what is the distribution? What's the relationship between threads and the distribution? How many of you did threads in the current implementation, in today's implementation? Okay. Those who didn't, did you use RMI? Okay, so RMI creates threads for you. You don't know that's happening, but it's creating threads for you. Okay. And uh, it's, 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 you know, like I said, you can have distribution, but no fine-grained concurrency. Okay. In, in, a, in a process, you get fine-grained concurrency through threads. Two different processes are themselves providing you with concurrency, but that's, you know, that's heavy grain. And uh, coarse grained, I guess, heavyweight and coarse grained. And you can have, of course, a process that doesn't talk to any other process, but it has threads in it. But the typical situation is that you have distribution and fine grained concurrency. So, by the way, before, you, before this assignment, how many of you had created threads? All of you. Okay, cool. Uh, so, why did you guys create threads for your for this assignment? So that sent. So which one needs? So you got a client and a server. Yeah, and 
It becomes tricky. Uh, you know, you can do everything with a Turing machine. So you can always do things without threats, but you're essentially implementing threats to some degree yourself, or you're, or you're not being so efficient. So let's just take the simulation problem. And uh, what about your client processes? Did they have to have threads? Did they have to? No? So there are, there are threads inside. I mean, Java, in Java, you know, threads are created by RMI. Threads are also created by who, what, what other aspect of, uh, what are the tool that this particular program is using creates threads automatically. It's the toolkit. That's also creating threads. Okay. So let's just logically look, you know, forget who's doing what, what's underneath and what's So, if I was just doing two clients that have to talk to each other, forget N clients, forget the server you're talking about, okay? What would I do? I would say, I would have a loop which says, wait for local user input, okay? That's one stream of communication I might get. Process that user input. Then I, would say, I could say, wait for remote user input, process remote. Okay, I need to do both remote processing and local processing. I don't know when a particular user might provide input. So I have to do some kind of waiting. Okay, and what's wrong with this? So if I'm just a lazy guy, you know, I want to just watch other people acting, I'll never see it. So there's a certain sequence I'm imposing. Now, if this was a, okay, so I should not impose order and user input in general. But I mean, if this was a chess game, this would work just fine. Okay, you would, you would know whose turn it is and you would always wait for the next person's turn. So there are some programs you could do, but we are not doing a chess game here. We want people to be able to enter at different times. Okay, so I could go and, um, you know, check if there is, you know, whenever you've seen a blocking call, like read user input, you've also seen a way to do peak, where you say, don't block me, but tell me if there's user input or not. So there's always a peak call and there's a get call. So I could just peek and say, hey, system, is there a local user input around in an input queue? Because ultimately everything gets queued up. And you say, if there's local user input, then process user input, otherwise go in. To the next. Okay. And I'm doing polling, essentially. So I could have a sort of polling interval. And you guys who have grown up with the web and Ajax probably think, oh, what? this is exactly what you need. I mean, that's a state of the art, right? You pull. I mean, that's, 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 that's modern computing. Okay? But of course, polling is bad. You know, your computer can, and depending on. So, what's going to happen? If my sleep interval is too small, I'm wasting computing resources. If the sleep interval is too high, it's not responsive. Okay? So, it's busy wasting, waste computer resources. The OS guys have been preaching for years, you know, have been coming up with all these solutions that don't require polling. And it's just amazing how web has set everything behind. Um, just because you know, it's not meant to be a tool that it's been used for. But, you know, it has its advantages. Okay, so we do threads. Okay, so you have one thread that waits for user input, another thread that waits for uh, remote user input, and these threads execute in parallel. Okay, whatever that means. Now, obviously, this, this, this solution doesn't have the drawbacks of the previous solutions. Do you see another advantage of the solution in terms of software engineering? So that's, you know, that's good. That you don't have polling. You don't have to have a sequence. That, um, that's functionality and performance. I'm just talking software engineering. So you have decoupling. Isn't it just cleaner to read? You know, it's interesting. Uh, you have threads in the kernel. And uh, I can sort of give you a personal touch to how these evolved. 
So I told you, and when I was a grad student in Madison, we guys wrote an operating system. And the operating system was written in a language that provided, provided us with threads. And the kernel was so nicely structured. And then one of the students from this group went to Sun. And Sun didn't have any threads in the kernel. There was just one old humongous big C program. And uh, he just invented threads at that point in Sun and then implemented Sun with threads, uh, with the kernel with threads in it, okay, based by his experience at Madison. And, you know, that was a very good way to get modularity because you were going to program in C in a, in, in, in a kernel. I mean, that's what happened. And C doesn't have any modularity. It doesn't have modules, doesn't have classes, nothing. So threads were a way to create modularity because you could say, oh, this is the scheduling thread, this is the interrupt driver thread, and, and so it, it, you know, it's a much cleaner code too. And this is one reason threads were added to the OS kernel. Okay, this is a guy called John Kepex who added this. Okay, so you all use threads, you, or most of you have used threads, you've studied threads, um, and uh, you know, I'm going to cover threads, and there'll be some repetition. But, you know, there's three ways I could have introduced threads or any concept, like we could talk of the theory, not show you any code, we could just take how Java threads are implemented and just tell you how it works, or we could go and sort of just do some kind of, you know, go and do a design implementation uh, study of it, what are the choices, what, and, and so that you understand things at a more uh, basic level. So that's what we're going to do. So when you guys study threads in previous classes, what topics do you associate with threads? Threads and synchronization. Semaphore, mutex. Shared variables, shared memory. Okay. Which you implement using ultimately using some calls. Or what, when you say shared memory, what exactly do you mean? Actually, it's more shared objects. So what's an example you're thinking of? So um, it has to be an example. Is it, if you edit a you change the count for an effect, uh, it's only one We'll see if that changes or it may not be it. Like so you're talking about the note, what kind of problems can occur. Mm -hmm. And semaphore is a solution. So when you guys use Java, I mean, what, Java doesn't have semaphores. Uh, hang on. Did you say you don't use Mesa, right? What do you say, Mesa? Mesa Semaphore? Who told you Mesa Semaphore? I don't know. I don't know Mesa. I know Mesa Semaphore. Mesa Semaphore. I don't. I don't know. I don't think it's synchronized. I know it's based on a single method. It wants a single method. Semaphore is for so, you know, things have to be sort of, anybody else? Two people are giving answers, but they're making no sense, actually. Um, and the other guys aren't giving any answers. You're right, Mesa is related to Java. In fact, Java is, Mesa. you know, when I was going to talk that James Gosling gave, and he was being hassled so much by the Xerox guys saying, oh, what have you done over Mesa, except take a few, take a few steps backwards? So, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, and, ja and poor Gosling, he was not inventing a language of the world, he was just inventing something for himself. It just became popular. So, you guys know how, I don't want to get too much outside track, but how did Java become popular? I mean, we were stuck with C and plus plus, C plus plus. And somebody like me who had programmed, you know, in, in Smalltalk and, and Mesa, I had programmed in Mesa you know, was just thinking there's no future for computer science. And suddenly Java got popular. And that was the most wonderful thing that happened that happened to programming languages. And today, given all this JavaScript in browsers, it wouldn't. But Java had applets. And these applets could be, so the internet the, 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 the got popular in general through the web browser. Web browser had very static pages, so then you could run Java programs through applets inside a browser, and that was a big deal. People didn't care about niceties of object-oriented programming and nice typing, but they said, hey, we are getting something we don't get otherwise. 
So because applets became popular, in fact, the first few textbooks in Java were written all to create applets. Now you guys don't even see applets, you know, because applets is all, all replaced by JavaScript. So uh, I'm just so happy internet and web became popular because I could program in a decent language again. Uh, so after I graduated, I just didn't program. I couldn't stand C till Java became popular. And I said, okay, now I can program again. Okay, so here are some topics you, you might have seen. Threads, bounded buffer. Okay, you always, that's, that's the one, you guys, none of, none of you has ever implemented a bounded buffer. Did you implement a bounded buffer so far in this assignment? Okay, but you know, in the next part when I say delay things, you might have to have a bounded buffer to do things clean. Okay, uh, command objects. You know, for those of you who've done 401 with me, you know what command objects are. What have they got to do with, so anybody want to define a command object? So that's, you know, that's a good definition. And so what do threads have to do with command objects? We'll, you'll have to wait. Okay. So, you know, how you do it in Java is through is through command object. That's one way to do it. There's another way to do it too, which is the lazy way, which many of you have probably used. Uh, so we'll talk about these two alternatives too. So bounded buffer and generics. What do generics have to do with anything? I've said earlier. So when you guys did a bounded buffer, uh, you know, I remember when we did, I did bounded buffer as a student, you know, the professor basically said, okay, the type of the element, let it be some type T. And he showed a pseudocode. Now I can write the pseudocode in Java because you have generics. Okay, so we just, and so we're going to use generics a lot in this class. I want to go in a little bit in depth there. Interrupts, what do interrupts have to do with anything with, with thre threads? So thread rescheduling happens on interrupts, and you have to know that. We, we'll see with it. To, to understand thread synchronization, you have to understand interrupts. Okay? You can't do thread synchronization without understanding interrupts. Okay? If you're going to implement it, if you're going to use it, of course you don't need to. Critical section, you know, that's sort of related to synchronization. And then uh, busy waiting semaphores, I'm sure you've seen before. Now tell me, Mesa semaphore or Mesa what? Yes. Okay. Don't be little monitors by calling them semaphores. Okay. And um, we're going to look at so hints and absolutes. Did Kevin teach you guys that? So this is a principle in systems in general. Hint versus absolute. Absolute is I guarantee you something. Okay, so I guarantee you that, you know, when you send a message to this particular party, the party will receive it. Hint is, you know, most probably the party will receive it, but it may not. So please go and try this other replica instead, if it doesn't. That's like a hint. So people have been so obsessed with absolute semantics that they've created things that are very inefficient. And the hint semantics makes that easier. And what Will was saying, which I'll talk about in slow motion, uh, is, is an example of that use in synchronization. Okay? And we'll see that Java implements uh, Mesa monitors and Kevin and I debated for a long time whether it took a step forward or a step backwards when it did its implementation and we'll just see you know, a little bit of what happens there. Path expression. Anybody heard of path expression? Okay. So when, almost nobody I know, no professor or no student has ever heard of these. Uh, but I'll talk about that to the extent I can. I don't think they've ever been implemented. So here I, I will talk about the design rather than, than the implementation, but I, you'll really understand the topic best when you really understand it well, uh, when, especially how a bounded buffer really works when you look at this. Okay. So let's quickly go through the familiar topics. So program versus 
process versus thread. So a program is an execution instance, uh, a process is an execution instance of a program. And uh, so thread is an independent activity within a process associated with the process in a stack. So you think of a thread as an active agent with data structures. Okay. So you've got one thread here, another thread here. I can go and click on a thread, see the variables um, in that thread of, of, of the various activation records in the stack of that thread. I can look at the stack of the other thread. So you sort of treat it, look at it as an active thing. It gets an active thing with passive data structures that it manipulates. Okay. But ultimately, the thread, a thread is itself a data structure to the operating system or to the thread implementer, it's a thread data structure. And so what are, what's, what are some of the data structures you associate with the thread as a data structure? So if you're an operating system implementing a thread, what data structures do you keep in it? I already said a thread has a stack. What else will the thread have? So a pointer to uh, um, the memory space of that process, yeah. A heap. So all threads of a process share one memory space. So they all share a heap. That's all in the process. When a process is created, the whole image is created. And the threads just are within that. I mean, when I draw the thread pro inside a process, what does it really mean? It means they share a memory of this. They, they share the memory address space. You might have variables or the So the thread local variables, the only variables that are local to a thread are on its stack. No, you can declare a thread. Oh, you can thread, declare a variable that is the thread. Okay, yes. No, you can declare a variable that is local to the thread. What does that mean? So that when two threads look at the variable, they have their own. But how do you do that? There's, I think it's called thread local. And they just they just allocate some part of the memory space of the process that those threads share. I don't know. Maybe it looks like a thread ID. I'm not sure how it works. So it's just providing you. So all threads access that, or one particular thread, or all. all threads. But I don't understand. I mean, all threads, the, the, the memory that is allocated to the process, some global variable is accessible to all threads anyway. So unless you go and say, you know, this variable is accessible only to these threads, you're not doing anything special. Well, so you could implement it naively in Java by having a map of thread IDs to values, right? That would be a simple way to implement it. I don't know how they do it. No, no, but I don't even know what the it is that you're implementing. The it is that you can allow any thread in the process to share some variable. Is that what you're calling a thread local variable? No, certainly. I mean, any variable, I'm not sure. So why don't you read that up and just tell us next time? because I'm not sure what that really means. Uh, because all variables that are not in the stack, that are global to the method the thread is executing, are accessible from that method. It doesn't matter, you know, it's just by definition, because that's a shared space. So unless you're saying, okay, this, 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 set of, this variable is associated with these threads and not other threads, you're not doing anything special. Okay. So why don't, you, why don't you look at that and maybe you can send me a mail, a pointer to that, and, or maybe you can tell us in class also next time. But now I'm talking of thread as a data structure to the OS. So what thread operations can you execute? Thread is an object, yeah. So start, how about start and non-started? What's the difference in terms of the operating system? What, how does it, how does it? Started, then it got to the problem that's not 
If it started, does, is it really running? If you have three threads started, are they running on it? Are they really running? It's not scheduled. It's not that it's not scheduled. It's not scheduled. Okay? So, you have a stack, registers. Each thread has its own set of registers. Okay? So, my registers are not being corrupted by your registers. And one of them or you can think of as different, it's a program counter. They're executing different parts of the code that they're all sharing. Okay. Priority, you can change the priority of the thread, make it higher or lower. And status, what could I mean by status here? You know, that's where, where what's it doing? Okay, so thread implementation can be operating system, programming language, library, whatever. So let's status. So there's always a current thread. Let's assume a single processor. Things get more complicated with multiple processors. In a single processor, there's one process thread that's running. That's the current thread. That's sort of thread five here. And then there are all these ready threads that are schedulable. But before you start a thread, it's not even schedulable. It's not even ready, right? And so that might be thread four that's not ready. And you might have, you guys, have sort of all seen semaphores to some degree. So semaphores make threads wait. Each semaphore has its own queue. So you might have threads queued on various semaphores. Okay, so you need a status to sort of indicate they're not ready. So status is whether current ready, not ready, no, you know, some other state is captured by thread status. So now we said that, you know, uh, we talked of rescheduling. So rescheduling, rescheduling happens when exactly? So a thread's executing, thread one started. When will thread two get a chance to execute? Yeah, thread one so when something with higher priority interrupts it, or when it dequeues, dequeues itself, you're saying two things. Now threads never dequeue themselves. Huh? They, do, they do wait. And when they wait, uh, they wait, uh, uh, and, and so at that point they call, make a call indirectly to get out of the queue. And so that's, and then at, this, at that time some other thread may be scheduled, or when, what did you say the second condition was? So an interrupt is a hardware event. So threads don't get interrupted, interrupts happen. So interrupts affect rescheduling. How exactly? What kind of interrupts will cause rescheduling? So there's a hardware interrupt, right? So the interrupts are what? So what, what devices interrupt computers? What are some example devices? Yeah, user input. Sorry? Network intro input. I ran out of time. How does a computer keep track of time? Or how does the OS keep track of time? I know, but how does the operator, the computer, so that's fine. Whenever threads created, a time quantum is allocated to it. But, you know, I don't have a watch here, but I can keep track of, I can look at that watch. But how does an operating system keep track of time? So it actually counts the CPUs. It goes and checks, okay, these many instructions took that much time. That, that would be an interesting way to do it. I, by the way, did that once. I was running a Fortran program. I couldn't do anything else. It was for, a, can you believe it? This is scary. This guy did something, this was, this was a medical program, and this guy won the best PhD award for his PhD. And I was running a Fortran program, and I just had to go and use instructions to keep track of time. You know, and I had to make sure that two branches in a loop took the same amount of time. So I added some extra loops, uh, two branches in the conditional took the same amount of time. This is a real-time program. And I just made sure that I ran loops there uh, to equate, you know, to make it equal. But you have time with interrupts. Okay, so how interrupts cause... Rescheduling is 
So context switching occurs uh, as a result of time quantum expiring or some other higher, higher priority thread becoming ready. Okay? Or you, you're voluntarily waiting for something. Okay? Um, and uh, so higher priority thread becomes ready typically as a result of some network interrupt, for instance, that this particular process was waiting for some network input and suddenly a network interrupt occurs, so now it's eligible and now you want, you want to always execute the most, uh, the highest priority thread, regardless of whether the currently executing thread has finished its time quantum or not. Okay. And by the way, with multiple CPUs, that's a, that's a very interesting topic, but I won't get into it, at least for now. You have uh, multiple ready queues, you could have multiple ready queues, single ready queue, all kinds of interesting things. Okay. So I guess I animated the wrong thing there. So let's look at the program counter. So we know that each time a thread executes the next instruction, the program counter increments, right? Where does the thread's program counter begin? When I talk of a process, the program counter begins in Java in the main method or in C in the main method, the first instruction. In the case of a thread, where does the program counter begin? In general, run is just a Java implementation. Let's talk in general where, what, what part of a program will the thread execute? Okay. So you think of, think of a program as, as consisting of a bunch of procedures or methods. Will all threads execute the main? You want, you want threads to be able to execute different methods. So it has to be some identifiable portion of the program. It has to be a, some method. Okay, so it has to basically execute a procedure. In, I mean, in, if I was talking of threads in C, I would say it executes a C procedure. If I was going to talk of threads in Java, I would talk about it executing a particular method. Okay. Execute some identifiable portion of the program. You can't just go and say, let the PC start here you know, at instruction number 25. Firstly, how do you express 25? And if you allow 25 to be executed, all kinds of corruption can, you know, all kinds of inconsistent things could occur. So it executes a method called asynchronously, essentially. That's what a thread is. But you can execute a method called synchronously, wait for it to finish, or you can finish, call it asynchronously, but you don't for it, wait for it to finish. So the thread creator does not wait for the method to terminate. That's the difference between a thread and a procedure. So that's so here's his thing. You can say buffer dot put hello. And you know at this point you know that the print line has completed by the time you go to the next instruction. Or I can say thread put thread equals and I'm you know I want I want to be a language designer myself, so I say async buffer dot put hello. Okay, and that's essentially what I've done is create a thread that starts executing the put line. And, and at this point, if I go and say print line put started, that's all I can say. I can't say put completed because who knows when it will complete. Okay. So that's conceptually what a thread is. Now Java doesn't quite have this syntax, uh, but that's conceptually what's going on, right? Uh, so before I talk about, you know, why maybe it doesn't have this syntax, anybody? Well, we'll talk about that later. Why do I have a thread object? You know, when I had a procedure, I just said buffer.put hello. I conceptually want to just go and say async buffer.put. So why return a value as a result of that, you know, I mean, this put is a procedure, it doesn't return a value. Even if it returned a value, even if it was a function, at that point, the function hasn't even completed. So there's no point returning anything there. So we said that a thread has operations in it. I kind of hinted to you already. So on the left, I showed you the variables. And there's things like start, okay, where you created the thread, but it's not eligible. A created thread is just suspended. It's in a suspend state. Okay? And then you can resume a thread. You can explicitly suspend it after it's been created. You can interrupt it. You can change its priority. There's all kinds of operations. That's when you realize a thread is both a data structure and an activation. 
Okay, so let's go to the syntax. You know, why do you think Java doesn't allow it? It doesn't have this nice syntax. I don't know myself. You can just guess. Well, if you're just getting an object, if you're, it would make more sense to call it an object or a buffer or something. That's the same thing. So, no, I'm changing the, the return call of buffer dot put more of an abstract idea of a method call. Yeah, but why don't I just use the syntax? I mean, that's what a method is, right? It's just you, you guys go through just hoops to go and do this. Why not just do this? Yeah. It's just a procedure call. That's what it is. Ultimately, a thread is an asynchronous procedure call. Java does, gives you no more than that. It just makes, makes you do things in a very roundabout way. That's all it is. When you guys do a run method, that's all you're doing. I know. So I'm just saying it's all indirectly, you know. So, so this is this is certainly shorter, right? Okay. And Java provides you with two ways of doing threads. One is the quick and dirty way. One is the right way. And the right way requires a lot of work. That's why they have a quick and dirty way. Even the quick and dirty way is is less quick than this and far more dirty than this. It can do whatever it does inside, you know. I mean, this is... It can, I mean, no, no, why would it need an anonymous class? It doesn't mean anything like that. It's... See, Java can... But ultimately, it's being compiled into some underlying language, like assembly or, or it's Java. So you don't have to compile Java into Java. Ultimately, you're using, in fact, a thread package. Ultimately, this is exactly what you're doing. The operating system is giving you some thread package. You're building a layer on top of it. The operating system is thinking in terms of this. this. So the implementation will be identical or, in fact, cleaner with this. Okay? It's just that this requires a keyword, async. Okay? And language designers like to not throw too many keywords. If they can do something with, with a library that's built on top, the threads cannot be built on top of the Java language. I mean, you have to... Under you have to go and deal with the OS at some point. Okay. You can do the thread library without OS intervention, but the threads are very limited. Okay, so if I have five threads in a... In a, in a, in a so maybe I'll let me ask you, why, why do you think the OS has to be involved in threads? When I teach OS, I have students build threads in C as a C library. OS is not involved. So if I have four threads running in my program, and that process that I run, just, you know, the OS doesn't know about the threads, and one of the threads makes a blocking call, what happens to the other threads? If it makes a blocking call, the OS blocks it. If it's reading from the file, if it's reading things, the OS has got to block it. All the other threads will block. Which is not what you want. So unless the OS is involved and, I, and OS knows, oh, this thread blocked. If this thread wants to do the blocking call and not this other thread. Okay, the OS will not be involved. So ultimately, the Java's implementation is using some kind of un, uh, OS OS package. Okay, it's just language syntax. I assume they won't think, you know, they didn't want to invent another keyword. And people are too eager to invent new and new words, and you have to learn new words. So just, uh, in other words, I don't believe. There's any loss of functionality here. And it's very clean what a thread is doing. It's just an asynchronous procedure call. So, how about this? Okay, I still don't want to go the Java uh, uh, gossiping way. I want to do things myself. So I go and say new thread. And I pass to thread the object on which I want to invoke the method, invoke a method, the method itself, and the arguments of the method. And I say new thread, buffer, put, sava, start, start. I don't have to create a new class. You know, I don't have to create a runnable implementation or a subclass of thread. I just do this. 
this is the standard way of doing threads, by the way, in operating systems. So in Java, you can't pass methods as arguments. Isn't that interesting? In C, can you do it? C++, can you do it? And Java does not allow it. So is Java, you know, why does Java not allow it? Gosling knew about C and C++. How many of you pass uh, procedures as parameters in C like, like languages? Have you ever got burnt? No, you guys are good programmers. What's the danger here? How many parameters does this constructor take, the thread constructor? In general, sorry. No, the at least two. Could be n. N is greater than two. Now, in C, can you pass as many parameters as you want to? You can. Java won't let you do. And why not? Yeah, I don't know what string format is. Yeah, so that's just two arguments. That's like like the, the, the like, like the C format string. Yeah, but Well, it, I can tell you how it's done. Is it safe each time? I mean, you, what you just do is pass as many arguments as you want in, on the stack, and you just have the reader just have the implement a read, read, so you have to basically go to the stack, figure out how many, you go and put a number first thing, how many arguments you passed, then the colleague has to go up to the stack and say, oh, I, I should look at these many arguments. It goes to the stack pointer, does it. That's how you do it underneath. Okay, and uh, it might have something special to do that, which is not a regular procedure call, but you can't define a procedure with multiple parameters in Java. Okay. And that's why in Java, you see in other languages, you would say print, a comma b comma c comma d. Java doesn't do a comma b comma c comma d. That's why Java goes and says a plus b plus c plus d, because it will only allow. So print is written that way. So I, you know, I have to go and look at what exactly you're talking about. That's another. That's, so he has a homework. You have a homework too. In the newer version, okay. And and what's the danger there? Yeah, so that's what you do. You, you can always pass an array yourself also. I could have just passed an array here and had the colleague read the array. I could have done that myself. By the way, you can always do an array yourself also when you don't have, you just pass one parameter with a variable length. But it becomes dangerous because you might go and pass the non-required number of parameters. And also here, isn't there a relationship between buffer and put and sava? Put must be a method defined in buffer. Sava must be an argument acceptable to put. Where is those constraints uh, specified? No. So you can pass anything. You can, that's what, when I said, you know, have you guys been burnt by this? You've been careful, but I can pass an int there and it'll go through the array because the array will be an array of objects. And, and so it's very dangerous to do this thing. So thread constructor must take varying number of arguments and varying number of parameters to construct a method not allowed in type safe languages. Uh, and method parameters not allowed in most OO languages. And again, you know, if you're doing this, yes, it's safe, but it's safe to the degree that it's an array, but how the in array is interpreted may be quite unsafe, okay, when you have a varying number of parameters. Because the parameters have to have types. An array is an object, something that will, be, is of a particular type and is subtypes. So there's no way you can constrain the, the parameters to be of different types and call it safe. Okay? So it's, it's, it's not safe, but one of the things that happened in Mesa, the language you guys mentioned, 
So the reason C took over, even though Pascal was such a nice language, Pascal came before C, was because Pascal did not allow you to cheat at all. Everything had to be type safe. There was something called variant records where you could cheat a little bit. And C said, hey, we can't write an operating system in Pascal. So let's go and create a language that is both good for the operating system people and for the uh, people not doing operating system. So C became popular in operating system world through Unix and everybody wrote C. And Mesa came from Xerox and they said, you know what, by default everything will be type safe. But if you want to go and cheat, you have to go through big hoops to cheat. And then you are actually, you know, you're saying, hey, I am driving without seat belts, I know what I'm doing, you know, and I won't claim insurance if something that bad happens. So that's what Mesa did, and Mesa was also a language you could write operating systems in. Microsoft, which is, in, which is sort of in the middle of, or was in the middle of basically doing more secure code, um, said that everything should be written in C sharp. They told, I was sitting with the OS group at that time, and they said, even the kernel will have to be written in C sharp. And we all laughed. I mean, how can you do the kernel in C sharp, you know, because of all the type safeness? And, you know, a year later, I learned that they backed off from that decision, that the OS code could be written in C uh, for, for the reason. And that sort of, they made it very clear that you could, you could do things uh, in two different languages because one is more efficient. But maybe these features that you're talking of are meant so that, well, Java, you can't use to write an operating system because it's, it's, not, it's not compiled into native code. But maybe C Sharp has these features so that it can be used to write OS also. OK, method parameter is not allowed in most OO languages. So if you want to call a method, what do you do? Firstly, what you want to do is somehow type this method signature, right? You want to say that new thread, and you want to give a signature of the method that the thread is taking. So that you could say, OK, yeah. Yeah, you don't subclass interfaces, you implement interfaces, okay? So basically what you do, an object is more than a method. It's a bunch of methods. So that's why we get to command objects, okay? So it's a, just an embedded operation and parameters. It's a method call, okay? So it has an execute method. You execute it to invoke, to start the method call. And the execute operation takes no arguments. And where are the arguments passed? To the constructor, okay? So... Different, different implementations of the same interface could take different arguments. And, but ultimately, uh, so this is, this is sort of an interface with the execute operation and, and sorry, sorry, a command object is a class that implements an execute operation defined by some interface, plus it has a constructor that defines some arguments, okay? So a constructor takes target object and parameters or operation as arguments, and a command represents a procedure call. Okay, so now we're going through all these hoops because Gosling didn't want to invent the async keyword, or he didn't think of it. Okay, but it's not a bad solution. This is command objects you create all the time. Okay, you can create undoable command objects. Okay, so now what is what is the runnable that you guys have used? It's a command object that implements this particular interface called runnable, which has a method for executing, which it calls run. And any thread object that implements this interface must define a constructor that defines the appropriate object and parameters. And I might have one object that takes one set of parameters, another object that takes another set of parameters, two different classes implementing the same interface. The thread library doesn't care, it just calls the run method. So I finally executed the procedure call. That's what I've done asynchronously. Okay? So here's an example implementation. It's a producer, implements runnable, and it has a constructor that takes the bounded buffer as an argument, the string um, argument to it. It goes and assigns the, the constructor parameters to instance variables. And when you call run, it refers to the instance variables to make the method call. That's, is that, uh, all of you have created threads, is this the approach you've taken? Anybody taking a different approach to call, uh, creating a thread? You can extend thread. Okay. So firstly, this is the run method. This is the constructor with parameters. And we are seeing now, you know, that I'm 
if you use a list interface, you can say list angle bracket string to go and say I want this kind of string. So bounded buffer is kind of a list that's a bounded buffer of various types and we are saying this is a string bounded buffer. Okay. And thread creation, you see now here, you say producer one is the, is the runnable and uh, you say a producer string greetings hello, you pass a particular uh, bounded buffer and a particular argument. Producer two, you pass the same buffer with different argument and you say a new thread to suit producer one dot start, new thread producer two dot start. Okay. So basically, think again of it as the, an async procedure call and you're going through all these hoops because Java did not want to have a special keyword and it didn't want you to cheat on number of parameters. Okay. So you understand now why it's designed the way it is. Okay, so what's going on here? The thread object, when you said new thread and you passed it to producer, it has a reference to that runnable object, right? When you say start, it goes, uses that reference to find its run method and execute it. So that's one way of doing it. And the other approach is a producer is a thread. You just make the producer be a thread. Thread happens to implement runnable. Okay, so you have to go and then you can go and override its default impl its implementation of run to write your own code. Okay, so you don't have to go and, uh, well, that's another way to do it. Um, and then you can just say a producer dot start. So why is this, is, this is quicker and this is somewhat quicker maybe, it's dirtier, why is it dirtier? This is how Java first created things. Then it went and did it wrong, did it right way. This is Java 1.1 was a runnable interface. Think software engineering again. Yeah, why? That's what I, isn't that what you've been told in your classes? Well, the procedure call, you can call directly. You mean the run, see run is calling a procedure call that was defined somewhere else. The procedure call was defined in the bounded buffer. No, it's both asynchronous. That's a thread execution is asynchronous. Yeah, but why would you say a thread dot run? I'm just saying you still have the option to run. So then you're saying this is better? No, I'm saying that, well, that does contain both synchronous and asynchronous. Yeah, this is more flexible in some sense. But I mean, it's just, why would you do dot run when you can always do bounded buffer dot put? So the same thread can be used to run different command objects? I mean, you can create, I think you can do that with the, with the other method too, because you just created, I don't know what different context means, but the same runnable certainly can be used in different threads. I mean, we, did, we saw that in the previous example. Yeah. But certainly there's, that, there's decoupling. There's certainly decoupling. I mean, a thread executes a procedure. A thread is not a procedure. That's what this is saying. It's saying thread implements runnable. Thread and runnable, we remember, is just a procedure call. A thread is not a procedure call. A thread makes a procedure call. So this is from a purist point of view, this is just ugly. So, a command object is not a thread, or a thread is not a command object. And we realize, we realize that runnable is a command object. And a thread is not a command object, or a command object is not a, either way, look at it. Thread is a command object because it goes and implements runnable. 
and the producer is, which is really a runnable, is a thread. Yeah, like you said, it's not decoupled. Now, whether practically speaking there's a disadvantage or not, I don't know. But certainly from a purist point of view, it's just confusing things. You don't realize what a thread is. And it's always been kind of, people, when they have to create a thread, they always look up the manual and say, oh, how, is, how did you create a thread before? Because this whole logic of what it actually does is not embedded in the person. And, and so this sort of hopefully makes Okay, uh, so let's go into bounded buffer now, which goes, we know how to create threads. The next question is thread synchronization. For thread synchronization, I need an example. I'm going to use the classic example, the bounded buffer. Okay. And let's get into defining a bounded buffer. Okay, so we need to figure out the data structures. We need to figure out the methods. And we're going to look at multiple ways of implementing bounded buffer. But one of the things we also have to figure out is how do we create a bounded buffer which takes an arbitrary element where the element of the bounded buffer is arbitrary. We know how to use generics. Some of you know how to create generics also, but not all of you. How many of you have implemented a gen generic class? Okay. So not all of you have. So for those of you who have not implemented a generic class, how do you think one would implement a generic class? How would a bounded buffer be, be declared? So bounded buffer has two methods, get and put. Okay, get goes and returns some buffer from the list of buffers and put inserts a buffer into a list of buffers. Okay? So when I say bounded buffer, angle bracket string, angle bracket, I'm saying I want a version of, the gen of a generic bounded buffer where the elements are of type string. I could also say bounded buffer double, capital D. Yeah, I have a bounded buffer of double that. So if I'm declaring the put method, what signature would I have for the put method? If I'm defining the put method, the bounded buffer interface. Invent, be inventive. Normally I have to say get return type string. Put argument type string. I can't say string, so what should I say in the declaration? So it is a subtle concept. There are some of you who have not implemented, right? If you were writing pseudocode, what would you write? Sorry? 30. Okay, so you would just go and say some type element type and you declare what types you're using in the start. And this is Java's philosophy. That don't just use, you know, every variable has to be declared. That doesn't occur in some languages like JavaScript, right? You can just use a variable and if you use a variable that's not been defined, it's just defined. So you have to go and say when you declare the interface, there's a bounded buffer and I have these type variables in there. Okay, element type, and you say element type and, and element type here also. And the both element types have to have to be the same. So I have to say element type here and element type here. Right? And that means what? Saying I, using the same element type twice in the uh, in the code means what? So they, they're, the, they're the same thing. Okay, they assign the same. It's the same value. We'll see that. Okay, so after that, it's very easy. So generally, you can say interface, you know, any scope. It is a method, class, interface. We're going to use generics a lot, by the way. You know, I've said that earlier. So we have to really understand this well. So it can be a method, class, or interface with the type parameter. It's, it's a generic. And when you, what you do with a generic, you elaborate a generic. This idea of generics was invented in a language called, anybody want to guess? It's a famous language, you probably haven't even heard of it, but language called Ada. How many of you have heard of Ada? Okay. 
it's a generic gen so you know when when java was invented people said so what is it offer over mesa and at one time ada was asked the same question what is, what exactly do you offer over mesa except confusion so uh, but they invented this idea of generic and the word elaboration is something that was in the ada context okay so you can elaboration of generic by giving actual value to a type product and you know have you guys some any of you used type variables in like functional languages ml so they really do things right java is kind of in between so there's a single implementation though it's not in ada what happened was if if you elaborated interface i with string and then elaborated a class with string and then a class with double you would get a copy of that class with all the strings changed all the type t's changed by string with string and all the type type t's changed with uh, double you would have two different implementations here you have only one implementation which creates all kinds of issues also okay so assigning values to type parameters is a compile time activity for type checking only so there's only a single implementation uh, but it's uh, it's basically a compile time okay so you've got the interface now you can say a public class a bounded buffer element type implements bounded buffer element type what does that really mean i've got two element types here what does the element type after class mean uh, of after after a bounded buffer mean now i'm asking to the whole class not just who haven't seen those who haven't seen generic Okay. Now first, tell me when I say a bounded buffer, forget the other second element type. The bounded buffer, angle bracket element type, angle bracket element type. What am I saying to Java? So I'm saying the generic, yeah. which takes one type parameter as an argument, right? And that's what it's saying. Now, when I say implements bounded buffer element type, what am I saying for the second element type? What am I exactly saying? So, whatever parameter that it has is the parameter to be used for the interface also. I can say implements implement type element type only because I have declared bounded buffer to be a generic interface. which takes an argument so here i'm elaborating it the second one is an elaboration the first one is a definition and i'm basically saying my value that's assigned to me is passed on to the elaborator it's all for type checking it's not really a runtime activity but think of it in ml it's a runtime activity okay there's something in between it's very confusing actually because i'd seen the ada concept i'd seen the ml concept and this is somewhere in between and and there are many things that i would expect that don't happen as expected okay um You guys, how many of you have seen Prolog? So you know what unification means in Prolog. How can you not know unification in Prolog and know your Prolog? What's unification? So in Prolog, you have variables. that get assigned values you give rules you say a is the grandfather of b whatever that a and b is if a is the father of c and c is the father of b or a is the fa father of or c and c is the mother of it. you give rules like this you give these variables and they all when you the same variable name a has to unify with the same value in each, each of its occurrences that means the same value has to be assigned to all of them okay so we are just basically not doing an explicit assignment but this is an assignment of sorts it's saying the element type has to unify to the same value in all occurrences so if i say element type 1 if i say element type 1 and i say bounded buffer element type 2 what would happen because during elaboration there is no element type it says where is the element type two? so uh so
So why don't we just have another syntax? Why, you know, we're doing, we're just taking our value and passing it on. Why is it not implicit? If I say bounded buffer, just element type, why isn't it in, implicit that I will go and pass this value to bounded buffer, the interface? You could have two, like, say you wanted to have, like, two, two generic types, and then in the implementing interface, you want to, like, reverse them or something. You wouldn't have one really. So a class can implement, no, so not implementing interface, implementing class. Well, if I'm going to have a class implementing multiple interfaces, I mean, you know, I really have to have, I have to have something like that. In fact, I might have a class. Let's look at this class. This class is saying, I'm a bounded buffer of strings. I don't want to take any parameters. So I'm implementing bounded buffer string. So it's not automatic. You know, it's, you, you really have to declare it. And, 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 you know, I can't. So I couldn't have just said a bounded buffer element type and assume that that's, What's, what's assumed, uh, meant, that's allowed. And also, the better example is this one. So you have I1, T, I2, T. They both use the word T. Okay, that's the word you used, T. And class, you know, I've got to say, look, I implement T1, comma, T2. And I pass T1 to I1 and T2 to I2. Okay. So that's why you really need names. So that's my interface. So let's look at the implementation now. Uh, so nothing, nothing, you know, this is probably what you've seen before, right? Uh, I've got a max size object, buffer of certain size, size equals zero. Now what is the, what are the next in and next out doing, you think? Have you guys have seen bonded buffers? Do you know? So circular bounded buffers, you guys have seen that concept? All bounded buffers are circular. So if it, you know, you're just sort of going and advancing. Next in is advancing where you're putting items. Next out is advancing where you're consuming items. Okay, size is keeping track of how many items there are. Okay. And by the way, my convention, as you will see, you don't have to follow it, but um, class AT implements interface T. Okay, so when I have Assuming that the class implements a single interface, that's the convention I use. And you, you guys obviously can use any convention you want to, but that's, that's the convention that will make it easy to read the code. Okay, so I've got my put method and my get method. And I have no synchronization right now, so I say um, if the number of items is more than, you know, if the bus buffer is full, then I return. Otherwise, I go and put the element at the next in position. And because it's a circular bounded, bounded buffer, I go and add it modulo the size of the buffer. And then I increment size plus plus. And the get method is saying, look, if the buffer is empty, return nothing. <coughs> Otherwise, I increment the next, I put, take the element from the next out position, increment next out, modulo the, the size, size minus one, return. Okay. So it requires polling. Like I said, you know, we are, we, are the, we are the Ajax generation, so we don't care about polling here. Uh, what other problems do you see in this code? Assuming you're happy with polling, that the producer will keep polling till the producer gets an empty slot, the consumer will keep polling till it gets a non-null value. It's not threat safe. Will it work? And when people say it's not threat safe, they say, look, you know, when there are multiple threats accessing it, and this is a producer-consumer problem. You know, you're expecting there to be a separate threat for consuming, separate threat for producing, maybe the multiple producing threats, multiple consuming threats. So why would it not work with multiple threats? So... The problem is that this method is not executed atomically. During, the during any of these methods, the method executor may get rescheduled, an interrupt might occur. Okay. So, so let's take two threads, 
Okay, there's two producers. You, you took the consumer example, I'll take the producer example. So one thread is going to deposit one greeting in this string of greetings. Another thread is going to produce another greeting. So what happens, I've got two threads started. Okay, they're both at the start. And I'm examining the top thread right now. And it's going to say, okay, let's execute. So hello thread is executed. It's got the hello argument passed to it. And the other thread is blocked here. It's, 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 it's also, it's not blocked. It's just not been scheduled. It's, it's in the ready queue, but not executing. The next thread, go, this thread goes and puts an element at next in. And before it increments next in, it goes and gets unscheduled. Okay. So at this time, the zeroth position there has the hello value. Okay. But next in happens to be zero. It's not been incremented. Okay. With debug points, you can just sim break points, you can simulate context switching easily. And now, the SAWA thread is scheduled. I don't know why, it, yeah. That's because I'm examining this particular, yeah, I'm examining this particular thread now. And it goes and at the same next in position, it puts SAWA. Because the first thread never incremented its next in. Those two operations go together. You know, you go and put a value and you increment the value. So what do you have now? You have this guy overwriting the value of the other. And what you get in the buffer is a function of the order in which... So program behavior depends on when rescheduling occurs. And we can think of the buffer as being sort of a set. And it doesn't matter in what order the set gets filled. So it's, by that definition, it's a non-deterministic program because the set is Sava in one case, and if it all executes without preemption. It could be Sava, hello, or hello Sava. Could, the set could be these three values. Okay, the order doesn't matter. Okay, so what we need is the critical section. So I have about a minute left. You guys want to define what critical section is? You've all seen, I mean, if you've seen Fred, you've seen Transition Semaphore, you've seen critical section. That must be done atomically, which means that you can't have two different threads executing it at the same time. That's a sufficient definition. It's, uh, it's a necessary sufficient condition, but not sufficient. So basically, you're saying you're going to put a lock with the critical section. And it's going to check whether you can proceed or not. You cannot proceed if there's not the thread in the critical section. Sometimes you can't proceed even if there is no thread in that critical section. Can I execute the get method if somebody is executing the put method? They both access buffer. There's a shared variable. Things can go wrong. Okay, so you could have multiple pieces of code all accessing the same data structure and together you want to execute only one of them at a time. Okay? So basically, code that can be executed only if certain conditions are met by other threads. So it's not just no other threads in that critical section. Uh, other threads should not be executing the same critical section. Other threads should not be executing other critical sections that access the same data. Okay, that's critical section. So basically, we have a lock. Okay, the next question is how do we implement critical sections? And we, we look at that a lot.